Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first, fun to see you again. Uh, I was a little bit jealous of uh, Burke and uh, Lucy being able to give all the fun stuff about bioinformatics and everything, but I've been traveling too much, and I'm going to travel a bit next week, too. But there are two important lectures remaining. Today, I'm going to talk about slightly more applied things, but we're going to use all the things that you learned previously in the course, in particular modern drug discovery. This is largely going to be what the third hand in task is based on, that I think that you're already able to download. Some of you might even have gotten started with it. Uh, and then next week, I'm going to finish things up. I will spend probably one hour during the next lecture talking about modern protein design and where things are heading in general. And then the second half of that lecture, I will likely just do a recap of the course and uh, Q&A session. One important lesson with that, and that goes for people seeing the recordings too. Um, it's entirely voluntary, but I won't, I might spend 10 minutes or something going through the main topics or anything. And after that, it's up to you to have questions for me. I will stay as long as you have questions for me. I will answer any questions. But if you don't have any questions, I will happily leave the room five minutes after I get there. Um, so think about that for next week so that in case there is anything you want to question or whether we should revisit. But the topic for today is drug design. Um, and in particular, how we're going to use this, all the things you've learned about molecular modeling, simulations, free energies, and I'm going to cover docking in particular. Um, and what you probably picked up from the last few lectures is that this whole concept of using the fundamental laws of physics, the interactions that we covered in the very first lectures, uh, but then we rapidly got to the point where we realized just knowing the energies is not enough. To actually explain what happens in chemistry and what happens in real life, we need to understand free energies. And when you need to understand free energies, that's why we had to take this detour of first understanding entropy. If you do not understand entropy, you're just fumbling in the dark when it comes to understanding free energy. And then if you're, if you're happy in quantum mechanics or something, if you only want to look at the energy of individual structures, if you don't care about the world where molecules have multiple structures, you can happily ignore entropy. The only problem is that that world is not the real world. Um, so we certainly approximate with a ton of things. Um, that's the whole reason why we threw out quantum mechanics so early on in the course, is that entropy in the real world is usually a much bigger problem than the fact that we have slight approximations in our interaction functions. Um, and that's also why we got all the way to simulations. The reason why we use simulations instead of just looking at structures is that simulations allow you to capture the entropy. It's not that you're simulating how a protein moves in real world. And God knows that there, I've seen my fair share of PhD theses as an opponent when you see that the PhD student happily claims that they can simulate how a molecule moves. You can't. And the main reason for that is you don't know the velocities to start with. Second, even if you did know the velocities, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle combined with the fact that these are chaotic systems would mean that they would diverge in no time. But simulations are an amazingly efficient way to sample things and get a sense for the entropy. And that makes it possible to calculate free energies. Uh, but what you would typically do if you work in a pharmaceutical company is roughly the sequence. You would somehow get the new fancy smancy receptor that they are super interested in because it could be a billion dollar drug. And then they would argue that you should try to model this based on a bacterial protein. I'm not sure how much Lucy covered that, but the reason why this is so common is that it's very difficult to crystallize human proteins. To tell the truth, we don't really know why. Human proteins are not very stable. Um, and bacterial proteins are much easier to work with and crystallize. So that's why it's so common that we have a structure from a prokaryotic bacterial channel, like all these ion channels that she covered, but then I would like to create a model of the human one so that I can try to design a drug, because the drug design market for bacteria is pretty limited. They have very bad health insurance. Um, but then you need to, might need to build some side chains. You might need to energy minimize the structure, and then you might simulate the models of the structures. But this will just give you a small movie about how the protein might move and everything. And that's not really anything that the pharmaceutical company is willing to pay anything for. The reason why you're interested in this is that can we move things that you traditionally do in the lab and do them in the computer instead? And that's what this lecture is going to be about. So in general, pharmaceutics is a complicated field that over 100 years has been reduced to very, very simple things. Um, There are lots of processes in the body. Um, some of them are natural processes that happen, and you get ill just because you get old. In other cases, there might be defects in your genome, and in other cases, there might be uh, 
uh, well, whatever, external damage, uh, say trauma or something, and for whatever reason you would like to influence a process in the cell. And as you might hopefully recall from the very first lecture, that if there is something happening in the cell, and I said that there is a molecule involved, your first guess should be that it's a protein involved. So normally the way to influence a protein in the cell, that is that we take this target, and then we want some sort of drug complex, some small molecule, to bind to this protein and change something how it acts. And this would then elicit some sort of biological response, if you're lucky. The way that this is done for 100 years is pretty much trial and error, which is not as horrible as it might sound. Uh, we'll get back to that. Uh, the last 40 years that we've been able, because we know no structures, we've been able to unravel this in much more detail. And we know for a whole lot of these drugs and pockets how they bind. So you might, for instance, have a deep binding pocket, hydrophobic pocket where a drug is binding. I actually don't remember what that is. I should know, but I don't. Uh, this is another example where something is binding pretty much on the surface. There probably, hopefully there are a couple of questions you ask yourself. How do you know that something is a, in a binding pocket and how do we determine whether things bind there or not? For now we don't. Uh, and that's kind of the problem, right? Um, both in the lab and in the computer. What can we influence and how can we influence it? And in some cases there might be multiple different ways. Um, normally, if you have a structure, that's nirvana. But in many cases you're just working, say, on the biological level that there is something we have no idea what it looks like, so just draw it as a circle. Uh, and then there might be something interaction with something else. So in textbooks you will frequently see very schematic pictures like these, and the only reason we know that these two molecules somehow interact with each other, and there might be some sort of specific antigen peptide or antibody here, but we don't know exactly what they look like. And then you just draw it schematically. And depending on how we change the look of these binding surfaces and everything, we might be able to get either prevent things from happening or turbo kickstart it to make sure that it happens even without something present in the body. Uh, if it's cancer, for instance, we might be interested in kickstarting the immune defense to make sure that the immune defense kills the cells more efficiently than they would otherwise do. There are a ton of things in your body that we could theoretically hit. Um, there are the entire signaling system in and out of the cell. Um, it's not a coincidence that I asked Lucy to cover membrane proteins for you. Membrane proteins are primary drug targets. Uh, there is a whole lot of things related, say, high blood pressure. Um, that's usually proton pumps, uh, again, membrane proteins. Um, a whole lot of uh, neuropharmacological diseases. Uh, sorry, neurological diseases. Neuropharmacology is the research about their, uh, the drugs targeting them. And again, there is no limit. But if you start to classify all these, roughly one quarter of all the drugs target something called G-protein coupled receptors. And I'll cover what those are. You don't, I don't think I know. And then I think this part is roughly, let's see, that's nuclear receptors and that's ligand-gated ion channels. And that's voltage-gated ion channels. Now we're above 50% of all drug targets, all proteins targeted by any drugs, and they're all membrane proteins. I would get, you could probably continue. I would get that there's probably two-thirds of them or so are membrane proteins. And that's if you count in the number of targets. If you count in the amount of dollars, which is pretty much the most important thing for pharma, then it's probably closer to 90%. So while membrane proteins, we frequently go around and claim that membrane proteins are important because I do research on them, and they are important. They account for 30% of all proteins in your genome, or at least membrane-associated proteins. But in the pharma world, it's either a membrane protein or nothing everything. And that has to do with that they're the windows and doors of your cells. We are particularly interested in ligand-gated ion channels. I might come back to that if I have time. Um, there are a couple of things drugs can do. Um, and many of the things I will tell you are actually based on history. And remember, historically, until the 1960s, we didn't have structures. So how do you test things? Well, you would test it biologically in the lab. Do you get the response that you were hoping for, or can you prevent a response that is bad? And that means that you can try to classify things. Um, the, if this is the normal biological response, and then you increase the concentration of the drug, either you would expect it to completely activate the receptor or whatever it is. And I know this sounds abstract. I haven't really told you what the receptor is. So I'll come back to that. But if a drug has 100% efficiency, you get the full effect. That's what we call all these drugs that stimulate, that create an effect, are called agonists. And if you get the full activation, we usually call it a full agonist, or sometimes just agonist. 
And an obvious agonist would be the drug that normally does something. For instance, in the, in the nervous system, the, the signal transmitters, they're agonists. They bind to the receptor and create a response. You might have a drug that should somehow help this. I want to I wanna open the channels a little bit, but you might not want to put the pedal to the metal, right? And then you might want to have a drug that's a partial agonist. It kind of lubricates it a bit. It creates a little bit of response, but not everything. And that would be called a partial agonist. You would frequently in the literature see something called an inverse agonist. And an inverse agonist is pretty much a drug that creates the opposite response. If this drug would normally open a channel, this should close the channel instead. Literally create something that's opposite. And then it might sound very strange. Why on earth do you have something that's called a neutral an uh, antagonist that doesn't do anything? Well, it's not that it doesn't do anything. An antagonist that binds but prevents things from happening. Um, so let's say that you're a drug that would normally go and create, uh, that would normally go and open the door, right? My drug might simply block the door, so you can't open it. I'm neither opening nor closing the door myself, but I'm preventing you from doing what you would normally do in the body. And that's a very common type of drug. I would even say it's the most common one. It's, it's easier to destroy things in the body, much easier to destroy than create an effect. These are things you should be aware of. Um, agonists, full or partial, antagonists, and inverse agonists. And in particular, the agonists and the antagonists are the common ones. And somewhere here, you start to think it's easy. You're just going to use simulations or docking, as you're going to do in the hand-in task, and determine whether things bind and what their effect is. And I wish it was easy, but I spent two, three decades uh, doing research on that. Um, the problem is that part of the fact that that's difficult, the really complicated part in your body is not what happens when the drug reaches a protein, but it's everything else. Uh, the reason why it's difficult is that the sec first you need to get, the compound needs to bind to the target. That's what I'm mostly going to talk about today. But even if you have a compound, that's great. It's not okay if it binds to 50 other targets, because that creates side effects. There are some really horrible side effects to this. Um, we have one example on the ligand gated ion channels we started, I think it was Merck. Well, I shouldn't blame them, but one of these large companies a few years ago, they had a new compound on the market. It went through all the stages of clinical trial. And then at the very end, when they started to test this on patients, it turned out that a small fraction of the population had an allergic response to it. And if you get that on the operating table, you basically die. They had to pull everything from the market when they've already spent probably $10 billion or something, catastrophe. Uh, and that's likely because it was binding or doing something elsewhere. Uh, you must survive from administration, that is eating it, to where the target is, the brain. That is way harder than you think. Your entire stomach is based on destroying things, right? Anything that's a protein is gonna be digested by your stomach. You have a special barrier between the blood and the brain. And the whole point is of your body is to protect things from going over this. So that's super difficult. Uh, you need to, basically, if you want a, what you call a blockbuster drug, something can tell that you want something that you can eat because no patient wants to go to the doctor and get five injections a week. Well, they will if it saves their life, right? But you're not going to go and get five injections just to feel slightly healthier. Nobody wants to do that. And it's expensive and it's complicated. And you're only going to sell it to rich people even if it's really life-threatening disease. And then you should have a slow and steady release of the drug so you don't need to take pills all the time and you don't want to get all of them. And what all this is called, what's called admetox, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity. Uh, and in practice, this is usually the largest hurdle. It's a relatively easy to find things that bind, but tons of drugs fail here. So what we've done historically is that actually that there, are, there is an infinite amount of molecules, uh, but in practice to fulfill these, literally based on trial and error. Lipinski, several decades ago, formulated that things have to be small uh, so they can be transported in the blood and everything. So they should have a molecular weight of roughly what you call half a kilo Dalton, um, so roughly atomic units. Uh, it should be relatively polar. You don't, I'm not gonna ask you about what these log P numbers mean, but it's polar enough to get into the bloodstream. If it's a very hydrophobic molecule, it might bind great to other things. But if it's very hydrophobic, it's going to stay in the stomach. It will never be dissolved in the blood, so it can't get out to your muscles or brain or whatever. You want a few hydrogen bond donors and a few hydrogen bond acceptors, because if you have too many, they're going to start to stick together and everything. Uh, and it should be recent. It can't be too polar. So it's relatively non-polar, so it can get across membranes, which is kind of the opposite of that one, right? 
And that was true for drugs historically. Most of them would fulfill this. The only problem is that the last 20 years, roughly, we hadn't seen a single new drug. Uh, so that drug design, modern drug design is kind of, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that it's in a crisis, but it's getting complicated. And one of the reasons most drugs on the market, they would never be approved today. Aspirin? Are you kidding me? That's a super dangerous drug. You can overdose it. And if you overdose it, that you can destroy your liver and everything. That would never be approved on the market today. But you can go and buy it without a prescription. Uh, same with, uh, well, a whole of these normal painkiller drugs. Uh, be careful with them. They are really dangerous, in particular in combination with alcohol. But uh, because they're already on the market, we accept that. Um, but of course, requirements go up and up and up. And we always like it when the authorities improve, the, uh, have higher, put higher standards for the drugs, right? But the only problem that's going to mean that we have fewer and fewer drugs. Um, these are four examples of fairly typical modern drugs. Um, you have never heard these names. Olanzapine, pilocarpine, xylometazoline, clomethidine, and cipresidone. These are really the chemical names, and then there are market names that are different all over the world. Um, so what the way that people have typically discovered this is that they have a particular protein they're interested in. Say that you're working with proteins related to high blood pressure. And you as a company tend to specialize on a handful of receptors, and then you screen through, and eventually you find something that you can refine and improve and turn into a drug. So all of these are small, quite hydrophobic. They tend to have some aromatic ring structures. There is a reason for that. It has to do with entropy. Uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to cover that later, so I will actually say it now. If there were no ring structures, if these were large and very flexible molecules, can you imagine what would happen? Most drugs tend to be fairly small and rigid. So what would happen to the entropy when they bind if they are very flexible? It would be bad then mm. if they are very flexible. Because then it would be much better not to be bound, right? And then, it, of course, you could imagine having a super fancy binding scheme with tons of hydrogen bonds fitting and everything. But this is all based on likelihood. The likelihood that you will be able to find such a drug is very small. So that almost all drugs that you tend to discover tend to be have this aromatic ring. So there's not two. There might be one or two bonds that they can. Look at the top one. There's pretty much just one free bond that can rotate around. So they should be fairly rigid so they don't lose too much entropy when they bind. Otherwise, the free energy will never favor binding. So where do you get these from? Divine inspiration? Pretty, no, actually, not that far from it. So, first, it's important. Divine inspiration would be okay. Uh, and I think I covered that a little bit before in the course that there is nothing, actually, I might not have, there is nothing that says that this, for instance, is the best antipsychotic drug. I can virtually guarantee that it's not. But you don't need the best one, you only need a good one. So it's not like in nature where you've had 4.3 billion years of trial and error and need to find, refine the absolutely perfect structure. We are very happy here as long as we have something that has some sort of effect. So the traditional way of getting these is pretty much from uh, rainforests. Uh, rainforest is just an example, but you tend to find something in nature. And uh, say coca, I realize that there is some sort of tribes or something and they have a habit of eating leaves from a plant and if they eat leaves, they don't get tired. And then, of course, you would spend a few years researching this, and then you would identify the leaves, and then you would try to identify what is this chemical in this particular plant that has this effect. Or it might be a beetle that if it eats something, it's resistant to another poison or something, and then you try to identify what is it that causes this effect, uh, or the same plant or whatever. Uh, and then this might not be very efficient, and then you try to imagine, could we create a drug that looks roughly similar to this isolated compound? Can I then design a compound? to maybe, I might not even know what the receptor is, but if I know what the receptor is, maybe I can use the computer to design something that would fit it even better. And sometime in the future, we would like to be able to def design arbitrary peptides, proteins. And the, this is still a bit of a pipe dream. The reason for this, these small molecules don't have a whole lot of freedom. They're fairly simple. With proteins, we have all the tools in the toolbox. We could design anything. We could literally tailor make a key that would fit only your receptor, but that would not hit anything else in the body. The problem is you have something small and hydrophobic, right? It will bind to my receptor. The likelihood that it's not going to bind anywhere else in the body is fairly low. And that's when we get side effects. So in theory, proteins hold great promise, but it's, we're not quite there yet. Um, the way this works, both historically and now, is that first you need 
to identify a target. Um, and that's, that might sound obvious, but remember the last slide on the rainforest. I know that if you eat these leaves, something happens, right? But I still have no idea what response does that elicit in your body. So in many cases, you want to identify this leaves or whatever it is, what protein is that binding to? Is it, that might be a membrane protein or something, or angiotensin receptor if it's related to the blood pressure or something. And if you identify these receptor, we might start have a few candidates about what the binding sites might be. Um, and at this point, if you run a large pharmaceutical company, you might even determine the new structure of the protein to find out what the binding site is. And then we need something to start with. Uh, for now, let's say that that's divine inspiration. I'm going to come back to that shortly. And then we need to see, does this have any sort of effect whatsoever? Test it both in the lab and uh, in computers and everything. In general, that's going to be a very bad effect. Um, why it's bad, I'll tell you in a second. So then we need to improve it. And at this point, we usually go what we call hit to lead. Um, here we have a clue. Things are just pulling the lead. And at some point, if we're happy with this, you're going to start doing tests first in the lab and then eventually on animals. And somewhere here, the researchers like me, we are so thrilled that we completely give up the idea. To a pharma company, things have hardly started yet. This is where it starts to get expensive. So then you need to do three sets of studies. Uh, the first one is you need to ask, is it safe in humans? The second thing you need to ask, is it efficient in humans? That's a completely different question. In stage one, all we want to know is that it doesn't kill you. Does it have any effect whatsoever on the disease we're trying to treat? And in phase three, well, say that you want to treat blood pressure. There is a whole range of drugs already on the market. We're not going to approve your new drug on the market unless it's better than anything that's already on the market. And what you don't want to do, you don't want to fail here because that's when companies go bankrupt because it's astronomically expensive. The problem with this is that you fail. You fail all the time. Uh, actually, we researchers, so we fail something like 70% already before you go into the clinic. Is that good or bad? Perfect answer, but how is it good or bad? <laughs> uh, good. Yes, it's awesome. Why is it awesome to fail there? Because it's far better to fail there than failing here. This is the Food and Drug Administration. Here is where you've invested $10 billion of your stakeholders' money. This is where CEOs get fired. <laughs> so that, but this is where it cost of $1 million. Yes, yeah, so and researchers had a project that we decided not to pursue it because it was too uncertain. This is awesome. Uh, so you want to push failures down here, and this is where computers come in. The point is not for the computers to predict the perfect drug. The perfect drug we will find out here. But the computers might help us to turn that, you know what, in all likelihood we should not pursue this because it's uncertain whether we will be able to do it. And computers have the advantage we can have very, very high throughput. So the, the typical cost of developing a drug might be take between 10 and 20 years. Um, it takes... Well, time to patent is a bit uncertain. It might take a ballpark of 15, 20 years before you can patent. And this is a problem because your patent is valid roughly for how long? 20 years. So if you get it to market after 50 year, 15 years, you have five years of protection remaining. There are some exceptions to this where you can extend these patents and everything, but this is why drugs are expensive. You have invested all that money and you have five years to make the profit back. After that, it's free for everybody to copy. The cost might be in the ballpark of half a billion dollars or euros for a normal drug. The most, the most advanced ones are more expensive. And it might require a team of 150 scientists or so. Sorry? Why is it just General routes for patents. Okay. Um, that's an interesting question per se. Why do we have patents? You're engineers. You said, this is important, right? This is, goes to the uh, core, core of what you're doing. Why do we have patents? No. That's what everybody thinks. Sadly, a few whole of the politicians seem to think so nowadays. The original reasons for patents is to provide an incentive to share knowledge. Because the alternative to a patent is to keep your invention secret, right? But in, so the point is, when you have a patent and it's issued, it's public. But in return for making it public, during the next 20 years, you, have, you are the only person allowed to manufacture this product. And I have a right to sue you if you try to copy me. 
But again, the return is that after 20, because you made it public right away, right? After 20 years, everybody can do it. So there is this balance between the inventors, individuals' right of making a fair profit, but also the public's right on being able to build on knowledge. So that if we didn't have this, everybody would just keep their chemical secret and you would probably be able to go to a, some sort of clinic in a hidden location. You would get a drug and nobody would tell you what the drug is. Uh, so there are a whole range of tools you use in these uh, studies. So if you have, in the very early first, to identify these targets and everything, there's a whole lot of bioinformatics actually. We try to identify sequence variations. We might want to understand why is that you are susceptible to disease that most of the population is, and can we find deviation in your genome? Ten years ago, that was science fiction. Today, it frequently works. Um, at some point, this middle part, high throughput screening, here we do a lot of computers, so quite a bit on the lab too, but this is becoming more and more computer driven. And eventually, when you go into preclinical development, this is doctors and clinic and just injecting things and testing. Uh, lots of statistics. So if we go back to this plot that, for me, this is intermediate part is really the interesting one. Finding hits, seeing whether they have an effect, and trying to optimize things. And this is where computational tools are. Ten years ago, I would say that they start to make a difference. Today, I would say that they're driving everything. So what we typically happen is that we would have some sort of initial discovery uh, molecule. And I would identify this based on some sort of database, and then hopefully have a series that there are four or five of these that look roughly the same, that these are interesting ones. And at this point, literally, mildly interesting is just the key word. Uh, this is not a typical drug company will have hits every week. And it just means that it just barely rises above the noise level. And you, you tend to have an iteration frequency of four weeks. Every four weeks you want new results, both from the lab and the computational team and everything, and then we see have we improved. The interesting thing is, of course, can we improve and make this better? Uh, and the way you do this is typically that we test things. We need to test things at insanely great scale. And that we typically do in the lab. Uh, so are these really cool machines, uh, they're super expensive. They can test something like 100 to 250,000 compounds per day. And they just have these gigantic microarrays, and then you're testing different drugs under different conditions. And then we're screening this through with the computer and seeing in what cells did we see binding, did anything happen. And it, you, you pretty much just want a plus, zero, or minus sign. You don't care about the effect or anything, because again, with 150,000, if lucky, you might get 100 leads or something. The likelihood that you get zero leads, that, that's not going to happen. You will always find something which is the problem, because that these leads are not worth as much as you want. The cost is fairly low, maybe a dollar per well or so, until you start looking at <laughs> 150,000 of them per day. So this can be fairly expensive. And 150,000 is nothing. Imagine the size of chemistry space, right? All the possible drugs you can do. There is no way you can test all possible drugs. In other words, testing this even assumes that you have the drugs in the first place. Synthesizing a drug can cost $50,000. If you need to synthesize a new molecule and hire organic chemists to custom design a molecule, that's not going to happen. Uh, so that, in general, that there are tons of uh, ways that we can end. There are other experiments. You can use polarized lights and everything. But anything that can test whether something happens can be used in some sort of screening. In principle, this shouldn't really work, because at chemistry space, we sometimes talk about 10 to the power of 60 or something molecules, which is just estimate. Uh, the probability of finding a ligand that binds by random screening, uh, just one million of those. That you're testing one molecule out of 10 to the power of 10. The likelihood of finding a good drug is literally zero. But it's, well, sometimes it works. Um, there are, these are examples from a few studies that a friend, uh, friend of mine in Uppsala, Jens Carlson was involved a few years ago, the two targets, it doesn't matter what they were, they tested three and 200,000 compounds, respectively. In the first one, they got zero experimental hits, and that's when you cry. Uh, in the second one, they got almost 150. The problem is that this is expensive. Imagine now that you would like, zero is not a good number to return to your boss. Would you expand this to three million? 30 million? At some point, they're gonna say, okay, we do 30 million, but if not, I want your resignation next. If it doesn't work, I want your resignation. 
uh, because again, 30 million times one dollar, right? That's, that starts to show up in the books. So what you would like to do is, can you do this more efficiently in a computer? And that is what docking is about. Um, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so what you would like to do in docking is using sort of a large computer. Uh, and uh, instead of doing the centers where you, the largest possible centers in the world might be able to do 100,000 or maybe a million compounds. But if you do this in a computer, you might be able to bring it to a million per day or maybe a billion for a total project. And if you're testing one million compounds while my company is testing one billion compounds, sure, my method might not be as accurate as yours, but both of our methods are very approximate to start with. If I test one billion compounds, I'm going to have a 1,000 fold head start on you. And I have room for lots of mistakes along the way. So the problem here is you need to be fast, sloppy, but fast, fast, fast is the keyword. Uh, and I don't care so much about accuracy. These are just random. Literally, think of this as divine inspiration. If I come up with something that's good, we'll test it. There are a couple of very simple ways. Uh, and in particular, this is machine learning. But this is actually a machine learning method. One of the simplest ways is something called QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationship. And that sounds very fancy, but it's not really. Did Lucy talk to you about uh, ligand gated channels and anesthetics? I might have said about this. This is my love in life because that's my research. Uh, anesthesia is 150 years on trial and error. It's not really until the last 20, uh, 20 years that we've started to understand what happens when you fall asleep. But for over 100 years ago, Meyer and Overton independently formulated an hypothesis that said the more hydrophobic a compound is, the better it's going to work as an anesthetic. That sounds like a fairly simple test, right? So then you plot the oil to gas partition coefficient and against the potency of an aesthetic. I'm not going to talk about how you measure that right now. It's a pretty darn good correlation from 0 0.1 to 1,000. So this covers four orders of magnitude. That's the type of plot that's good. When a student send that in in the lab, you're convinced they've cheated. Um, it's perfect. So they drew the conclusion. And of course, if I now give you a new molecule that has this, uh, no, sorry. This is more hydrophobic, and this is better. So if I say, if I have a company that has an oil to gas partition coefficient here, is it going to be good? Good is down as anesthetic, or is it going to be bad? These are the good ones. So if you go even further down here, do you expect that it's going to be even better, right? Yeah, not exactly rocket science. So that's basically what you're saying. The, the structure here, or the, uh, the structure or the quantity is basically, if it is hydrophobic, we expect that it will be a good anesthetic. And that's pretty much a linear correlation. Yes? Uh, I just don't understand the graph, but surely the potency, even a high potency of an anesthetic drug, no? So I don't think that that's, a po that's not a potency. That's probably the maximum, uh, maximum alveolar concentration. So right. that's the concentration you need for it to okay. work well. Right. And the reason why I can say that, that carbon and nitrogen, they're kind of okay, but I, I recognize all these isofluorine, chloroform, these are the good anesthetics. Uh, that's why I said that, that. Forget about the y-axis there. And you could do this slightly more advanced. You could calculate the number of expected hydrogen bonds. If we have an aromatic ring, if we have a hydrogen bond donor close to an aromatic ring, is that usually good for this particular receptor? And what you would do today is that we would throw all this in a machine learning algorithm, and AI is super popular in this area now. And literally, you forget all about physics. And it kind of works, uh, sometimes and sometimes not. The advantage is that it's super fast, because once you've trained this, you can predict probably not just 1,000, you can probably predict a million compounds per second. So you can take not 10 to the power of 60, but probably 10 to the power of 12, and just screen through them. Those predictions are, of course, going to be lousy. But I will come back to that in a second. That the point is not that they're good. The point is that your predictions might be slightly better than chance, and that's frequently enough. Uh, you could check the, the mass, uh, the molar weight, the charge, the dipole moment, and everything. The advantage is that it's fast. The disadvantage is that if you make a very specific model, uh, that I know that I know that for this particular type of receptors, I need an aromatic ring and I need two hydrogen bond donors. You kind of already set the rules of the game, right? 
So you will find lots of things that have one aromatic ring and two hydrogen bond donors, but you won't find other things that might be even better. So that's literally why I say it, it's an okay-ish method, but it's no, nothing that makes people uh, write home and say that it's, it's used everywhere, but it's never really the deciding factor. But still, if, if I happen to have a compound and a target that I know really well, you could kind of, rather than having the drug, maybe I can make a blueprint of the drug. What is, rather than worrying about all those atoms, just as you used an alpha helix or beta sheet to de describe the important properties of secondary structure, we could do the same thing with the drug. Uh, so maybe it's important to have an aromatic ring there, an aromatic ring there, and then two aromatic rings there. And you need a couple of ch specific charges or hydrogen bonds. But instead of having all the atoms, you can describe that saying there should be an aromatic ring there, and then maybe something hydrophobic there and hydrophobic there, and then say a dipole there, and then just measure all the distances between these. And then throw this at the database and say, find me other things that look roughly like this. And this type of abstract model of roughly what things am I looking for in my compound and at what distances from each other is called the pharmacophore. Uh, and if you're going to work in the pharmaceutical industry, you're going to hear this. Um, because they're, I wouldn't say that we are, they are obsessed with pharmacophores, but during the drug design, this is kind of the typical bold print. I'm looking for something like this, but it should be even better. And then there are large databases where things like these are described. And again, it's pretty much just machine learning. Find things where the set of distances is roughly the same as what I had. And then there might be, when you do that, you typically turn out that there are a bunch of common elements. Um, I won't go through what this drug is, but so this is a particular drug that you had a full agonists, and then you had a bunch of variations of these, and they're all different agonists to a greater or a smaller extent. And here, you can probably start to see all of them tend to have these two aromatic rings in the middle, right? Well, that one has, an has slightly different rings, and that has slightly different rings, but they're kind of similar but you have different so-called substituent groups at the sites. Uh, and what you typically do in the lab is that you sit down and do more or less by trial and error. We say, well, you know, if all the good ones had a sulfur up here, maybe I should try to add two sulfurs. Let's see if that works better. Or if all the good ones had hydrogen bond donors here, let's add a second hydrogen bond donor or make it more hydrophilic in this part or more hydrophobic in this part. And the second you've done that, what do you need to do? Guessing is easy. I can easily say that, let's add another sulfur. Then you need to pay $50,000 to have this drug synthesized, because now you need an organic chemist to make your specific molecule with one more sulfur, and you need to produce maybe a milligram of it so that we can test it. That's fine for the first 10 weeks. The 11th time you come with a new guess, and it doesn't work, um, the, uh, the person in charge of this other might start to get a bit irate, right? This is getting very expensive. And that's why we would like to, instead of synthesizing these so that you can do a real test, what if you could just throw it in a computer and let the computer say, is it likely to be good or not? And that's where we get. Uh, there are a bunch of things like volumes that I'm not gonna be, uh, go into here. But what I wanna get to before the break, we have a couple of minutes, is I'm gonna stop myself. Uh, I have completely ignored the protein structures that the rest of the course was about. Uh, and we're not gonna, in some cases, you might not need drugs, uh, sorry, structures of protein to do drug discovery if there are lots of existing drugs already. I might just try to learn from pattern recognition. If you are four pharmaceutical companies, I might look at the drugs that you have produced and then I might do what you call a me too drug. Uh, and a me too drug is that I try to copy the properties of your drugs and make something that works around your patents. So it should not, intrude on your patents, but be similar enough that it will have the same effect. And that's awesome because it just takes me a year to develop that drug and then I will steal one fifth of the profits in the market. But I wouldn't be saying this unless we needed the protein structure. And that's where most of the things are happening today, molecular docking. So you have seen a bunch of proteins, a particular member of proteins in the course. And if we have the protein structure, uh, we might in some cases, there are even structures with known drugs crystallized in them. So we know that in this particular, and this is a dopamine receptor, we know where the dopamine molecule is bound. We might even understand the pharmacophore exactly, but if we have this structure, can't we just take other molecules, put them in a computer, and see how they bind? The good news, that's it, eminently possible. You could even do it with a molecular simulation. The problem with that, you've all seen how slow a simulation was, right? 
you can take one molecule and it will take you two weeks. So what we want to do, we want to do things like 100 million times faster. And that goes back to when you were like six months old. Uh, we're going to do roughly this. So you're just going to test things, test things, throw it away. If it doesn't fit, you throw it away, test, throw it away, test, throw it away, test, throw it away, and do that 10,000 times per second. You're going to be throwing away a whole lot of stuff that is really good, but I don't care because there is more than one drug in the universe. All I care about is reducing the number of bad things I have to test in the lab. It's slightly more complicated in reality, um, but not a whole lot. Um, so they, they're really, it's a very simple question. Um, you want to find out what is the best ways to put two molecules together. So first, define best. Well, we're not, I can't, I'm, I'm a poor bastard here, so I'm not, I'm not going to be able to use all those fancy interactions that we covered earlier in the course. Water, 12,000 atoms, I can't afford water. Uh, so we're going to need to have some super simple ranking solutions, just based if two polar parts are close together, that's good, I give it a plus one. If two, uh, if a Polar and the hydrophobic things are close to each other. That's probably bad. Let's give it a minus one. So you just find some ways of putting a score. It's not really a physical energy. Uh, if I have a very flexible molecule and that has to become very rigid, it's losing a lot of entropy. Let's say that's minus 10. Completely arbitrary. And we can, we can try to calibrate these based on experimental results or something, but come down with something that you can test in a tenth of a millisecond. You could use a force field, but that's usually too expensive. But then I also need to test many ways of putting these molecules together. I want to test the molecule in different orientations. There might be more than one binding pocket. Maybe the protein can move a bit. Uh, so for every molecule, I might also want to test it in 1,000 different places of each receptor. And now I already used 0 0.1 seconds for one molecule. So throughput, throughput, throughput. Everything here is about throughput. Uh, so we need some sort of good search method. And what you typically do is that you come up with a way of sample things, generate lots of confirmations of the small molecule, and this can literally almost be random. Uh, I would even say that it is pretty much random for several algorithms, and everybody is trying to argue that their randomness is slightly better than chance. And then we just score them, and then try to keep the best ones. If you happen to find a score that's good, maybe we should spend a little bit more time on this molecule, more do more fine-grained sampling. But again, the point here is not to do it perfect. The point is to do this fast and sloppy and use it as a way to screen as large as a part of the chemical universe as I can. We have two more minutes. Um, so even if you do this in the most horrible ways we can imagine, there are like six rotation and translation degrees of freedom, right? There might be four bonds inside the molecule that can rotate. That's already 10 degrees of freedom. And then the box, let's say that it's just 10 by 10 by 10 angstroms I want to sample. And then I want to sample just, this is like Leventhal's paradox, just come up with some sort of steps, maybe every half angstrom, and say sample angles in 10 degree intervals. And if I could do 100 confirmations per second, it would take 200 years to finish that for one molecule. This is unfair because in principle it would probably be more like 100,000 per second. So I could probably finish that in a month or so. But this has everything in docking is focused on speed. And what you then do is some, you've probably seen this in optimization, but we need to make some sort of initial population randomly, either of many molecules or the states, and then evaluate scores and check which ones looks promising, either in the sense what molecules look promising or what poses of molecule, the places where it binds look promising. And then we try to extract the best ones pretty much survival of the fittest, right? And then spend more time there. Maybe test that in a more fine-grained motion or try 10 different versions. This class of molecules seems to be interesting. Let's pick another 100 million of these class of molecules because we might something interesting there. And then we do repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. If you can come up with a better optimization algorithm, um, that would work equally well. I will have one more slide and then we'll have a break. Um, you could also cheat because we don't have to obey the laws of physics. I could take my small molecule here and then try to grow the molecule. Here I put my first aromatic ring and then I see, can I fit a second aromatic ring here? Nope, I bumped into the protein. Okay, throw away that molecule. Maybe here, grow the first aromatic ring here, the second aromatic ring here, that worked. The third aromatic, no, that bumped into, throw it away. Um, so that any way that you can come up with something is awesome. 
So this is, surprise this is way more of divine inspiration than you think. If you can give me 100 molecules that are worth testing in the lab, those molecules we might want to spend $50,000 each on. And then we can come back in four weeks and see what is the experimental result of those molecules. And based on those tests, we can then decide in four weeks, how will we do next batch of computational studies? But I will come back to that after the break and talk more about scoring and a little bit more practical examples. So let me the quarter past. Should we resume? So I spoke about these ways of trying to, well, more or less by divine inspiration, come up with algorithms that find things that are at least compatible. Actually, I think compatible is a great keyword. If things appear to be compatible, let's put it on the short list and retain it. But if things bump into each other, if for whatever reason it's unlikely that this is going to be good, we take it off the list. And this comes back to what I said, failing early is failing cheap. So it's much better to, in all likelihood, we will likely remove some very good hits. And that's fine because it's very unlikely that that is the only interesting hit. And as long as we find something of the, say, 100 molecules we retain or something, that's going to be fine. And similarly, the way to get this fast is that you could use the force fields we covered before. There is a slight move, and I'll come back to that, in fact, even using simulations. But most of the things that we use very empirical scoring functions that all the things you've learned in the course, when we know that it's good, hydrogen bonds, charge interactions, or hydrophobic interactions, we just try to very arbitrarily give that good scores. And in theory, we could also use some statistics and as you can probably imagine, this field is exploding with artificial AI-based methods and machine learning too nowadays. Um, I'm not going to, I will skip this grid because it's that important, but in principle, just come up with any type of algorithm. You decide how to sample things. So here we're not trying to reproduce physics. We just want to see what is possible and what is not possible and save the things that are, might be possible. So if we go back to that table I had. For both of these compounds, lactamase and crutzane, we actually got two and five docking hits, respectively. So these are completely computational hits. And yeah, those five hits compared to those 146 experimental might not sound so cool. The advantage is that this might have cost you $100. Kind of nicer to spend $100 and $200,000, right? Here? Well, this might have also cost you $100, and you got two hits, which certainly beats spending a third of a million dollars and not getting any hits. And at this point, they might certainly be lousy, but I don't care so much that they're lousy. This is something that to start working with. And as long as you have a starting point, it's much easier. There are, as computers have gotten faster and faster, that's the other important thing, is that these experimental methods, you can certainly buy two of those machines, but then it's going to cost twice as much. And anything experimental in the lab, and it does not develop that quickly. But all the computational methods, they become roughly twice as fast every year because computers get faster all the time. So what we've been able to do the last few years is that you can include, say, receptor flexibility or at least flexibility of the molecules. So you might want to test the protein both in a closed and an open state or allow the small molecule to push some side chains apart a little bit because just maybe, maybe that might make it fit better. And at this point, you might actually have a drug. This is something that binds. You will have to test it experimentally too, of course, but if in many cases when you test it experimentally, it actually turns out that there's, it's not the perfect correlation, but there's certainly a correlation that things that we tend to give low scores in the uh, docking definitely tends to bind a bit. The only, well, there, there are some minor details, um, such as you would eat five kilos of it per day. Um, the problem is that binding in chemistry is an equilibrium, right? And you don't have a very good binding coefficient. So the only way to get enough effect is to add so high concentration of this molecule that you would push the binding very much towards the bound state. You can imagine what's going to happen that five kilos of medicine in your body, that's going to lead to a ton of side effects. Forget about it, it's useless. Um, and this is the problem, so that to get rid of the side effects, so first, to, to be able to get rid of the side effects, and second, to make sure that you can actually eat one small pill a day, you need to have insanely efficient binding. So it should only bind to this thing we want it to bind to, and ideally nothing else. So you, there is a bit of homework to do here. We need to improve this by a few orders of magnitude. And one of the first, actually the first famous example, was the HIV-1 protease inhibitor. <laughs> 
I know you're not chemists here, Sam, but I'm, I'm going to need to use a word. So this was a first hit that they found in docking, which is a symmetric diol that had some tiny activity. And from that, they designed a pharmacophore uh, that says roughly what are the three parts you needed of this molecule. And then we found that hit in the database that looks quite different from number one. And to make that simpler and having fewer flexible things, at some point the chemist decided to remove a couple of things. We had a simpler molecule. That was the initial design. And then based on a number of computational screens and everything, you came up with an existing design with a diol, so they had two alcohols. Uh, and then we added some urea groups here. Uh, and then we optimized the stereochemistry for binding. Sorry, that was urea. Here's the optimized stereochemistry for binding. And this was the final drug. And that was one, actually not this one, of it was the first drug that was used in HIV treatment. And it's famous because it's the first drug that was actually designed computationally. There were certainly a bunch of experiments along the way here, but do you see the contrast to Amazon's? This was not based on the fact that we found a drug in nature that already had this activity. We started from a computer. We want to do something that inhibits a specific protein, the protease. Can we find something in the database instead and let the computer do the early part instead of the rainforest? And it worked. And since then, there have been dozens of more drugs like this. And this now enables you, if you're a pharmaceutical company interested in blood pressure, right? You don't need this lead from nature. You can now go into the databases and computers instead, which opens completely new worlds. Do you know what this is? This is something that makes a fighter jet look very cheap. This is $140 billion of revenue. One of the largest, a lipeter, which is an uh, drug used to treat uh, cholesterol, basically. Um, it's a great lifestyle uh, drug. This is the type of drugs pharmaceutical companies love because you tend to give it to rich Westerners that have lots of money. They need to take it the rest of their lives. Um, at its peak, it had revenues of over $14 billion per year. And until this $140 billion figure was until 2015. And again, this, is like, this can be an order of magnitude more than like, uh, like companies say, like Saab is selling fighter jets for. And this is why there is such an industry. There is an amazing worldwide industry for this. This, if you go to 2003 until 2016, this would happen. This is the revenue. What happened here? Patent run out. <laughs> this is why the drug customized, right? These were the golden years. This is where they put it on the market. And in this case, they, there are some patent extension laws now, so they had slightly more than five years. But this is the period where they could recover all their investment costs. And of course, this, this drug was, a, it was an amazing uh, return on investments, right? But for each such drug, there's probably 50 or if not 100 that failed. And of course, you need to recover those costs too. So that this certainly, make no mistake, they made a lot of money here. Uh, but over a very short span, you can make money. And at this point, it's all over. Then you need to restart. So what, what we get, if you're better, more efficient, you can find better drugs. You can find drugs that are, uh, get on the market earlier. Imagine if this drug had been on the market three years earlier. You would have three more bars here corresponding to $10 billion each. That's $30 billion. That's worth a bit of computer time. So both in docking and everything, we would like to use simulations and everything to make things more accurate, faster, and in particular, avoid, avoid the needs for lengthy experimental trials. But also, if we're going to fail, it's much better to fail right away. And Burke, I think, already spoke a little bit about free energy calculations and simulation and everything. And in principle, we are really good at calculating binding. Molecular dynamics can give very accurate results. The problem is that it's, it's slow. It's expensive computationally, not in dollars, but computationally. There are a few things that have happened the last few years. Uh, one of them is this David Shaw. Uh, did Lucio Burke tell you about David Shaw? So this is a guy who was a professor of computer science. Uh, I'm actually going to show you first. Let's see. This is a brute force simulation of drug binding. So you see that this protein, this small drug here, is eventually going to find the binding pocket in here. And I think this is a simulation that covers roughly, well, several hundreds of microseconds. 
it's a couple of thousand times longer than anything that you or I, uh, we did. So David Shaw uh, was originally a professor of computer science, but uh, then he went very early on left academia and went to Morgan Stanley, if I recall correctly, and pretty much the father of modern arbitrage trading in stocks because he's a computer expert. Uh, and then some 15 years ago, he went back to academia more or less as a hobby. But of course, if you run, I think it's at its peak, the D, the D. Shaw company was the world's third largest hedge fund. So that if that, at this point, you don't apply for an assistant professorship, but you just hired, well, he invested a couple of billion dollars, I guess, just hired 50 people for his toy company. So they've started to design custom hardware. Uh, ASIC, application-specific integrated circuits that can run simulations a thousand times longer than anybody else to really go after these problems. And they, one of their goals is, of course, that they would like to be able to predict drugs and sell these to pharmaceutical companies. And today, this is still super expensive, but when I was your age, we couldn't even dream of this. So give this another 10 or 15 years, this might very well be the norm in pharma. And what you can do then is that all the things that we've looked both in terms of protein structure and simulations, we can start to understand energy landscapes. We can start to look at, depending on where the ligand is situated, what is the interaction energy? In this case, we see if the ligand is close to the binding site, the interaction energy is low. Uh, and I guess this is another, actually this are two examples. Sorry, you don't see it very well here. But the overlap here is the gray structure here is the X-ray structure while the brownish structure there is the structure coming out of the simulation without any knowledge of the x-ray pose. So the simulations have been able to actually predict pretty much exactly how the ligand should bind without knowledge of the experiment. The other thing that this can do that in theory we could do this with docking too, but in some cases the problem is not just getting the molecule to bind, but the question is how long does it take to bind? Remember the thing I said about kinetic versus uh, thermodynamic stability, right? And just as far as the protein folding, it's equally important here. The fact that in theory you should be super stable in here, that doesn't really help if the molecule can't ever get there. Because it would take six weeks for your drug to take effect, you would be dead if it's a lethal disease. So in many cases there are kinetic barriers that it takes a very long time. There may, might be a native pose in there in the weak uh, gray structure, while what we end up with in a simulation is really something that sits out here. It hasn't really had time to go all the way in because we need a bunch of waters and everything need to move out. The waters there end up being trapped and that if you wait a very long time, eventually those waters will diffuse out and the ligands might take its place. And this can be important if you actually want to optimize what you call the onset and offset. It's important that the molecule actually binds quickly. This is super important in anesthetics. So, it's fun. Once upon a time, I was uh, hesitating whether I should go into physics or medicine, and that's probably the hardest decision of my life. And I think that everything in medicine uh, sounds interesting, everything except anesthesia, uh, because being an anesthesiologist must be the world's most boring job, and then I've spent the last 20 years working in anesthetics. <laughs> um, it's, it's super cool, um, because it is so intimately coupled to um, what we mean by awareness and uh, consciousness. And one of the difficult things in anesthetics, the reason why you need a special dedicated doctor and anesthesiologist is that it's difficult. It's super difficult. We basically, we need to take you to the brink of death, but be able to revive you. So first you add an anesthetic that makes you fall asleep. But of course, this anesthetic that makes you fall asleep, at some point it's also going to mean that you get muscle relaxants and everything, and your lungs will stop breathing. That's bad, because you're going to die. So then we might need another drug to either keep up your heart rhythm, we might need to uh, ventilate you, that uh, basically have a machine breathing for you. The only problem is that that might do something else to your uh, heart and then we need a third drug to compensate for that. Then we also need a drug to make sure that you should not have any memory of this, so that's a fifth drug. You're like ever giving this really complicated cocktail of drugs. And all of them will have different fall-up times but they might ten, take 10 minutes to fall off. So imagine that I sedate you, and then I've given you a little bit too much of this drug that depresses uh, your heart rhythm. And that's fine, right? I can just reduce the dose. The only problem, yeah, that takes 20 minutes. In 20 minutes from now, you're gonna be dead. So then you need to add a sixth drug to maybe keep up your heart. And then it's fine. We're over with the surgery, it went well. They stitch you up and they roll you out to recovery. And now there are six drugs and they all decay at different rates. So what if the drug trying to keep up your heart rhythm decays faster than the one depressing your heart rate? Then you're going to die in recovery. 
And that happens. People do die in recovery. Uh, so it's also about we need to understand not just that it binds, but how quickly they bind and unbind. And that's very difficult to get with docking and anything. And simulations are starting to play a role there. I will come back to that to give the examples because remember what I started saying: G-protein coupled receptors. Um, these, this is a gigantic family of proteins. There are 900 genes or so in a human coding for them. Not all of them are expressed. This is a bad way of saying. When I was your age, the number of known structure was a round number, zero. We did not know the structure of a single G protein coupled receptor. And everybody said that, oh, it would be great in the future if we had one. But the likelihood of ever seeing one is probably zero because the rumor at the time was that there were companies that had spent $2 billion trying to get structures, but nobody had succeeded. Today we have 40. So we know a huge amount of the uh, three of these. The, they are very difficult to crystallize. That's the main reason. So what happens is that you get some sort of neurotransmitter or something that binds in the extracellular part here. Then a miracle happens. Uh, the entire structure of these receptors changes through the membrane. And that, in turn, leads to a signal being transmitted to this G protein that sits on the inside. That's what's called the G protein coupled receptor. This is the receptor that binds the small molecule that is coupled to the G protein. And when this undergoes a transition, it's basically a signal of things on the inside of the cell. So this is the telephone network of cells. The reason why, there are many reasons why it's popular. Apart from its importance, it was also one of the, this class of proteins was one of the early membrane proteins because it's very simple. It's seven helices that go straight through the membrane. So we, it was one, rhodopsin and bacteria rhodopsin in particular that's closely related, were among the first proteins that we learned structures of. And the cool thing is that some, a little bit over a decade ago, there were suddenly two structures published in Nature the same week of the human beta-2 adrenergic receptor by Brian Kobilka and Ray Stevens. And I have to confess that I'm very partial here because I was a postdoc in, not in Brian's lab, but in the neighbor lab. Um, the rumor has it that there were even some collaborations between them, but that they ended up in being a split, and then they fought and uh, basically rushed to try to publish this both. I'm not sure if you know the end story of this, but in uh, roughly five years later, Brian Kobilka got the Nobel Prize for this, together with his advisor, for, but specifically for the studies of the deep protein coupled receptors, not for the structure. So Ray Stevens was left out there. Uh, The amazing thing with GPCRs is that if you start to look at the within, there's a tiny binding pocket up there. And even to me that it's virtually impossible to see where things are binding. It's actually not only impossible to see, even if you have the x-ray structure, if I don't see the ligand, it's virtually impossible for me to say where the ligand is. So it's a tiny binding pocket that is also very diverse. Different GPCRs will bind different things. And again, this is amazing if you have a telephony network because this is literally different extensions. Uh, but if you want to be able to understand one receptor based on another, it's really painful. There are one of the examples of this receptor. There is a carazolol, this particular receptor. It's a partial inverse agonist that is a beta blocker that it's basically uh, protecting the heart from the second heart attack once you've had a first one. And as I mentioned, there's been an explosion of structures here. Uh, so first you have the high resolution structures, and you got the active state structures. You have the structures with first receptor and G protein complexes. We now have NMR structures, uh, cryeum structures, and everything. So we're starting to understand not just what the structure is, but the entire movie. What is happening as it undergoes different states? What's happening? What the molecule is binding? How is the receptor being activated? Which again, it creates in a completely new universe where you can design specific drugs in it. Um, and we even have structures with lipids. Some of these structures were actually initially on only available to companies. And I think that's what, how some of, the fur, some of the first structure with Ray Stevens, was, he funded the work that way, that there were companies willing to pay for having a one year head start on everybody else. So the structure was deposited later, but during 12 months, only a company had access to the structure. And then you see more and more and more receptors. David Shaw has been involved in this too. So I'm gonna show you a small movie of a have a look at the time scale there and try to remember that in comparison to your simulations. And this is the small neurotransmitter, and then we're going to see what happens with the molecule here. We're already at half a microsecond here, and then it's going to it start to bind in the pocket, and then it goes deeper down, and then it goes even deeper down. Do you see that these were pretty much kinetic things that it had to get over? 
And now we start to expand the time scale so that up to roughly five microseconds here to even start to push a helix out. So now the entire receptor here went through a bit of a structural shift. You might see it better if I go back. You see that was the initial state. And with, this is the entire structural shift that transmits a signal to the G protein that sits on the inside that's going to create signaling inside the cell. Not only that, they were able to get a ton of data about this binding site. So all the random motion out here, eventually you got the ligand down to this inner binding site. So let's compare that binding site with what we actually had in an X-ray structure. Purple one is a simulation. Gray one is an X-ray structure. Pretty sexy, right? So the computers are able to predict not just simple chemistry. We talked about earlier in this course, we looked at hydrogen bonds, right? Or predicting how oil and water separates. This is pretty darn difficult. You didn't even see all the lipids and everything. It's a gigantic system. It's a large molecule that undergoes a major structural shift. It's a drug that we know is not only pharmaceutically relevant. We're talking about a lot of money here. And the computer can, at least within a couple of weeks, predict exactly how the drug is going to bind. And based on that, we can even, if based on these simulations, you can even uh, estimate what these barriers are, just like the ones we drew schematically before in the course. What is the first kinetic barrier? And then you get to this vestibule part, and then the second barrier when it jumped through the second step. Uh, and this corresponds very beautifully to different states we see in the simulation. And I'm, let's see. Uh, you can do similar statistics on this ligand binding site compared to what are, what are the things that we are close to, what amino acids are we interacting with. And if we now realize that there is, let's say that there is one or two amino acids here or contacts that are, this is not true for GPCRs, but let's assume that there is a mutation here and that we know that people with this mutation tend to be susceptible to particular illness. So maybe would in the future, maybe we would like to do a drug that's not just a general drug. Can we create a drug that specifically combats that mutation? So that if you have this mutation, it's going to be a very specific drug for you. You, on the other hand, have a different mutation. So when you get this disease, you're going to have a slightly different profile of the disease. But maybe we can have a second variety of the drug that is tailor-made for people with that mutation. So this, you might have heard this concept, it's called personalized medicine. And it's one of those, people have spoken about this as the next big thing for 15 years. It's still the next big thing. It hasn't really shown up. The problem is, I think, it's how to test this, how to make sure that it gets, uh, well, it gets clinical approval and everything, and you still have enough time to recover the investments before the patents expire. But there's lots of potential uh, revenue here. And, well, I talk about revenue, of course, there's lots of potential uh, impact for very severe diseases, too. I think that there is a second orthosteric site. Let's see if I had a small movie of that one, too. This is a second movie. You see, there's a second molecule binding in a slightly different site. And here we're already up to seven, eight, nine, ten microseconds. Pretty long simulations. I think your longest one was 100 nanoseconds or something. They've done simulations up to a millisecond, not of this particular protein. Um, and the cool thing is that on these time scales, this was pure science fiction when I was a PhD student. But on these time scales, apparently it's long enough that we can actually start to see biology. The Roughly where the state of the art today is that the second part is that we would like to understand the entire activation here. What happens when you're binding things in a large protein? This point here is not so much the deep protein coupled receptors, but I, I will still cover this as a way for you to see the coupling between physics and biology. The complicated thing in biology is that what I just showed you is a horrible lie and oversimplification. In biology, you would have the small agonist, the ligand binding. You would have the protein earthquake in the structure. You would have the entire G protein going through a major conformational change here, and then it would release another protein and everything. And I probably half the proteins on this picture, we still don't really know the details of what they look like or how they bind. We do have structures of these complexes now since 2011 and Brian Kobilka. But some of the most important research is still understanding what's happening in all these interfaces. What if you have mutations in these interfaces? A great, another great example here is not so much GPCRs, but signaling in general or viruses. What if there is a specific virus? How do viruses work? So viruses, they infect your body, right? But viruses are also proteins. Remember the tobacco mosaic virus. So that's a code full of proteins. 
So now you would like to identify and get something to bind to a virus. But the virus is also really good at mutating. So we're basically trying to create, an, we're trying to create something that should recognize something that is changing all the time. And that's another challenge. Can we then identify the specific things where it's difficult for the protein to change simply because they're most sensitive or something? So can we, in a very targeted fashion, go after the parts of the molecule that are most important and that are likely most difficult for the, well, protein, whether it's a virus or another important molecule, where it's most likely to have an effect either on the function or at least in the sense that the virus can't change it. And then in principle, if we understand that, we should be able to tailor the signaling. Either destroy the signaling. If you have too much signaling, I might just want to shut off, shut it off. Or if you have too little signaling, maybe I want to amplify it just five or ten percent to create a little bit more signaling. I'm going to talk a little bit about that next week when I talk about protein design, because that the goal is, of course, not to design proteins, right? But the goal is that I would like to have a very fine dial so that I can start to change the biological process and make it amplify it a little bit or dampen it a little bit. So there are dozens of papers published on this, both in simulations and uh, experiments every year now that we try to go after specific residues or tailor make new molecules that would have a specific effect. And Ron Dror in some of these papers they did, they even, they even they were man they managed to show not just how things bound, but as I already hinted in that simulation, they show that the entire molecules moves from the active to an intermediate to an inactive state based on the binding of this molecule. So now we're no longer just talking about binding. Um, the process of binding is called affinity. And the affinity just describes how, how strong do the molecules bind to each other. But this is what you in biology will call efficacy. How efficient is it? Binding to the molecule is just the first step, right? Does it have the effect that I hope it would have? Remember the, one of the first slides I showed today when you talked about the agonist. Just binding doesn't mean that you're an agonist. The reason why this would be an agonist is that it actually that it's binding of the small ligands causes the protein to move from the active to an intermediate to say an inactive state. Or in this case it would be an antagonist of course. And this is not quite science fiction anymore because there are, today there are dozens of examples of this in the literature where people have been able to use computer simulations to not just simulate how things bind but as a consequence of the binding how is the entire protein changing the shape and how is that having a functional role? I, actually I might let you go 10 minutes early today. I have a couple of more minutes. Um, why am I spending time going through this? Um, this is not science fiction anymore. This is super important. GPCR drugs in particular, two years ago when I gave this course, this was published right in the middle of the course. Uh, and Astellas, they bought a drug uh, company for some 800 million euros. So everybody is super excited about, well, GPCRs in general, but also specific methods that make it possible to create custom drugs. Because it makes you be, that makes you able to go after, in particular, lifestyle diseases and everything. We have a little bit of time, so there are two things I want to bring up. Um, I spoke a lot about profit here and everything. Is this bad? How bad is Big Pharma? I know, I know, I did. Can we talk about so, the, the, uh, the difference between uh, having state-sponsored medication or from diseases and having, and having like, big companies, private companies being able to run the market? And I suppose that's more a question, maybe, if you ask yourself. It is partly, uh, but I think that's the thing I told you. That, um, it is certainly a moral question. I'm, I, I, so I don't want to be the person protecting big pharma, necessarily. But on the other hand, as part of my job, I go around and, so first, I have no commercial interest in this myself, um, but we talk to quite a few of them. The one thing that fascinates me is that all these companies, they're full with people who are passionate about curing disease. Uh, and uh, the, th the thing that tends to motivate them the most is talk to patients and talk to people that they realize their work is actually curing ill people. And in the grand scheme of things, the first, that does not necessarily make these companies good. And if you look at some of the companies, by far, we talk, they like to talk about how expensive it is to do the research and everything. Um, and they spend almost as much money on research as they do on PR and sales. So, of course, that they're not necessarily noble companies. These are companies, on the other hand, that's probably true for Volvo and the other company. They also spend a lot of money on sales. 
And in the grand scheme of things, suddenly if you start to compare that, I think Sweden has a proud history of, say, Saab, for instance, doing great fighter jets and everything. Uh, it's proud Swedish engineering tradition. You could even argue from a security policy that it's important and everything. I, I don't see any moral problems with making fighter jets necessarily. And suddenly in that perspective, but wait a second, if we don't have any problems with making fighter jets and making money from that because we're good at it, making money from curing ill people because we're good at it? Sure, there, it's a political problem of people, how people should get access to the drugs and everything. But if you're really talented at curing ill people, this, shouldn't a good surgeon have a good salary? <laughs> Nobody's want to become a surgeon. And I think in the grand scheme of things, it would be worse if we don't have good surgeons. So I, I would just like to maybe modulate that statement. It's easy to think about big farming bad. And there, yes, there are tons of profits here. They're probably not investing as much in basic uh, research as they should. But the main reason is that this is getting very, very expensive. And we as taxpayers are the one constantly coming up with new ways. And every time there is a mistake in a drug, we are happy to sue them. And we argue that there are now 10 different more tests that they need to do. It will take them another three years. Yeah, but they only had nine years to make a profit. We just removed a third of the time where they can make a profit of the drug. So that means they will not have to increase the price by 50%. And then we think that's the company's fault. And in a way it is. Or we can say maybe it's our fault. That maybe the criteria we have for new drugs are so extreme and we're not willing to fund the research with taxpayer dollar. And maybe I don't think we should. So the point is we are part of this equation. It's not necessarily AstraZeneca or any other company being evil. The interesting thing, second interesting thing that's happening is that here I mostly spoke about small compounds. The very big thing that's happening is protein drugs. And that's what I'm going to speak about next week. Uh, so proteins are super complicated because suddenly we have very flexible molecules. So all these things about entropy and uh, being a small suddenly doesn't quite hold anymore. We're going to try to fold proteins in a way that makes it possible to create custom effects. And that's super cool because if you, if you think that these things are specific, imagine how specific all these protein folds we've been looking at it. There are, there are so many things we could do with proteins. But we are playing with some fairly big powers here too. You're suddenly starting to interact with antibodies and everything in the immune system. So there are some pretty catastrophic failures too. And I will, I'm not going to spend a full lecture on that next week, but there are some interesting lessons to talk about here. The final thing I want to mention here is Given your profile, one of the biggest trends that I'm actually quite happy to see is AI and machine learning going after not just disease, but health. So anything that has to do with, the, for instance, fitness trackers and everything, that's the, uh, that's the low-hanging fruit. But there is an increasing awareness of trying to cure disease before it happens. And this far, it has mostly been based on health exercise and everything. But what if we can find deviations in your genome that you are likely to get a disease in 20 years and maybe start taking preventive measures. You know what, based on your gen genetic profile, you should probably eat less saturated fat. Oh, well, we all should, but, uh, but there are going to be some minor deviations. You could even, it could be worse. Uh, for the general person, it's not so bad with a little bit saturated fat, but with, with your specific profile, it's catastrophic. You need to cut this down and do it now because you have 20 years. If you do it now, you're not going to have any problems with this. That's going to be way cheaper to address. Uh, and it, it's not going to be particularly fun to eat, not to eat all those fats when you're 20s, but it's probably more fun than getting the heart attack when you're 40. And there are a bunch of diseases like that. Um, one good example of the bioinformatics is Burka. Did, did Lucy talk about it? Breast cancers. So there are some, uh, there have been Angelina Jolie, for instance, she has a mastectomy where she removed her breast because if you have this gene, you're pretty, it's pretty much between 85 to 100% probability that you will develop breast cancer before you're 40. And if you get these breast cancers, you die. They're exceptionally aggressive. But of course, but because we can identify this with genetic tests today, you can prevent, preventive, as a preventive measure, remove the breasts, um, and then you will actually not get it. And if you think that's unfair, uh, it can actually, uh, it's less common, but occasionally it even happens to males too. And if you're males, it's pretty much a guaranteed death. Because there's one thing males don't do, they don't check their breasts. So it's some small sign of fairness in the world, I guess. Uh, I am going to leave you 10 minutes early today, but there are two things. Uh, think about this. Uh, and um, there's usually one or two questions about this, because it's important. And I think it's a beautiful carryover between super advanced physics, machine learning, computer science, but also health. Uh,
So the two big topics is describe this modern drug discovery, the pipeline, how it happens, the different stages. You need to be aware of it and be aware of it on the one hand, how it is coupled to physics, but also how it is not coupled to physics. Some of these things we are still doing better with trial and error. Rather, we're not doing it better with trial and error, but the point is that we do it faster. And if you can do something a million times faster, sometimes it's worth throwing physics out the window too. And the second part is that we should have a little bit of an idea about how this deep protein coupled receptors, why they are important and how they carry out their function by binding a ligand externally, changing the conformation, and then creating a signal on the inside of the cell. And with that, I will finish.